Hey everyone, I'll give it just a couple more minutes for people to join and then I'll go ahead and start. All right, let's go ahead and do this. Uh, thanks everybody for being here today and coming to hear my little lecture. Um, just to introduce myself a little bit, my name is Tracy Bass. I have an undergraduate from Appalachian State in North Carolina. My master's is from Indiana and then my DMA is from University of Missouri, Kansas City. Um, I currently live in Kansas City. I'm a freelancer here and I have a private studio. And I also worked for full time as a music librarian throughout school. I just kind of kept working in libraries and this is where I've ended up and it's great. And it'll make a lot more sense why my presentation has a giant resource list attached to it um, coming from a library, librarian perspective. Um, <clears throat> so today we're going to be talking about diversifying your repertoire. Just wanna start with some expectations I'm not here to tell anyone what to do. I'm just offering some ideas on how to analyze and expand upon your solo recital programming. My main focus is going to be about recital planning, but you can apply this to any sort of programming um, and any other, any other aspect of life as well. These, these topics we're talking about today can apply to anything that you do. Please use the chat or the Q&A as we go, add your thoughts, ideas, and suggestions. And what I'm, what we're talking about today, I don't have a comprehensive list of anything. There's so much information out there. So if you have anything to offer, anything to add, please do. Please be respectful of, of people in the chat and asking questions. Um, we're all in different places as far as our music education goes, and we're all in different stages and are learning about DEIA topics. And I'll define DEIA in just a minute. Screenshot what you need. Um, all of these slides will be available on my website and I have a resource list on my website with everything that we're gonna talk about later as well. And I'll show you how to get there in a little bit too. At the end, I'll ask a couple discussion questions and then we'll have some Q and A time as well if you wanna hold on anything to the end. All right, so <clears throat> we're gonna start by defining DEIA. Very brief general definitions. So DEIA stands for diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility. For diversity, general example, the wide range of people and their individual perspectives. Everyone's different. Everyone has something different to bring to the table. Equity, giving each individual what they need to be successful. Equity is the process. Equality is the outcome. Inclusion is the practice of providing equal access to opportunities and resources for people who might otherwise be excluded or marginalized. Accessibility is giving everyone equitable access along the continuum of human ability and experience. These things to me are all connected. I try and think about how they flow together and bounce off of each other and how all come together to work as one unit. So that's why I just say DEIA. Um, this whole idea for diversify your repertoire came from me trying to plan my next recital whenever this whole pandemic, whatever you want to call it, is over. Um, 
I really want to do another solo recital. It's been a while. Um, I've done some recording and stuff in the pandemic, but it's just not the same. I want I want to play a recital in front of a live audience. Um, and I started with like, I always like to have some sort of theme or some sort of connection between my pieces. And that's kind of where I started. My original idea was I wanted a wide range of dates, like as wide as I could possibly get it, starting with early music, maybe play something on a natural horn, expand to something written within the last few years. But I wanted no D-O-W-Gs, is my little acronym I have for this, and that means dead old white guys. I was trying to avoid dead old white guys. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about that later as well. And so this made me kind of reflect on my previous recitals. And I started questioning my past and how I can identify what's missing um, and how I can build upon that for a future that's more equitable and equal for all, all types of composers and music, musicians. Um, and I started, literally, I pull out all of my old recital programs and I made a chart with everything. I analyzed it by like race and gender and I just started looking and pretty much everyone was a dog. It's a dead old white guy. That's all I ever played. And I had always felt like I was someone that played a lot of music that maybe not everyone else is playing. Kind of prided myself in that, but I realized still just playing a bunch of dead old white guys. And I also looked at the music that I own and I realized I only had, I own a lot of music. Most of my teachers throughout my life have made me purchase all of my music by companies wanted hard copies. Um, and I realized I only have one piece by a female composer and one piece by a person of color. And I was like, whoa, I thought I was doing better than this. Apparently I'm not. <clears throat> so I created my action plan. I looked at my past recitals. I asked myself what, who, when, where, why, and how, and how I can address these with DEIA in mind. Um, and you'll notice I did what, who, instead of who, what, which is kind of how most people do who, what first. Um, but I went with what first, because that's just kind of how my brain worked. All right, so <clears throat> we're going to start with the what. What rep are you playing? Start with, if you don't even have an idea, just start making a list. Make a list of things you want to play. I always keep track of when I go to recitals, when I listen to workshops and stuff like that. I keep a list of things that I want to play, like things I find that I like. I hold on to that list. And when I'm at workshops and in a normal time, or I'm shopping for music or there's something I really like, I try and find as much as I can and order a few things extra every time if I can, just so that I'm constantly adding to the music that I own. And so when I go to plan a recital, I'll have those options. Um, think about why you're playing it. Why are you playing this music? Do you have some sort of connection to it? Is it because, oh, the sound is cutting out a bit, but I suppose that can be helped. Um, <clears throat> is anyone else having issues hearing me? I can just play with it real quick. Speaker. This might be better. Maybe, 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 maybe. Okay. <clears throat> so um, keep going. Who wrote it? Uh, what do these people look like? What do they represent? What community are they a part of? And what place does it hold in our rep? Are you playing just standard music? Are you playing just Mozart, just Strauss? Or are you are you trying to venture past that? Are you trying to play? new music? Are you trying to play music from the same time of Mozart, but not written by Mozart? Because there's a ton out there. It's just we tend not to play it. Um, do you want to create a theme? I, like I said earlier, I like to have a theme. Um, just having some sort of connection between my pieces really helps me a lot. Not everyone's like that. I don't think you have to have a theme. It's just something that really works for me. Um, and then if you can't find what you're looking for, like if you have gosh, I really want something really lyrical and pretty from this certain time period, but I just can't find anything that I like for horn or I've played everything I'd want to play. Make an arrangement. Take something from another instrument. Take something from voice. Something I'm doing right now is I really want to play some leader by Clara Schumann. So I'm doing a little arrangement of that. 
it's something that I just felt like was kind of a hole in our rep and I wanted to make it happen. So make it happen. Uh, if you don't feel comfortable doing that, find a composer, work with a composer, especially if you're a student or a teacher at a university that has some sort of composition program. These people want to work with you. They want to learn. They're going to take this as a learning opportunity as much as they can. They should want to do these things. So if you can't find what you're looking for, make it happen. Find somebody that can help you make it happen. Something else that I throw in here is types of horns used. Um, and this just means like use natural horn. So many recitals we go to, it's just somebody playing their double or triple horn, whatever they have, and they play that the entire time. Great, fine, nothing wrong with it. But there's, there's other options. Play something on natural horn. There are contemporary works being written for natural horn. You could also play something, if you're playing like a high horn piece, try it on a different, try it on a high horn. If you want to play something low, try it on a Wagner to it. There's no rules, let's mix it up. These are instruments that we need to have in our arsenal and we need to be practicing them and working on them. So why not apply that to your recital? And then how much control do you have over these decisions is something that I think we all need to consider because sometimes you don't have total control. I'm lucky right now, I'm not a student. I'm not associated with a, with a university as a horn teacher. I can pretty much play whatever I want. I can make it happen as long as I can find the people to make it happen with. Um, but not everyone has that. There's a lot of students who teacher, whose teachers control a lot of what they play. Um, and there's other factors that can go into this as well. And as we go through this, this list of discovery, um, this will be a common theme is how much control do, do you have over these decisions? Because you don't always have all the control. Basically our goal with the what is create the widest reach possible within our limitations. And those limitations could be how much control you have, or if you have a theme, what can you do within that theme? So now we're going on to the who. Who are you collaborating with? Uh, are you going to have, have an accompanist or not? Are you going to have dancers or any other sort of performing artists with you while you're performing? Uh, there's other options than, other than piano. Uh, something that I've always tried to do is incorporate harp where I can. There's quite a few pieces that are already written for harp and horn, um, where there's a lot of piano accompanist parts that can just be played on harp. Try it out, find a cool piece that you think would work or take a few pieces to a harp player and be like, do any of these work? It's something different. A lot of percuss percuss percussionists can also be accompanists, something else you can think about. Um, who is your audience? That's another really good, good part to apply to choosing the ref because for me, I really wanna go home. I'm from North Carolina. I really wanna go home and play recital sometimes just because my family, my whole family hasn't heard me play in a while. And I know if I brought all 21st century works, my mom's going to be sitting there not really understand what, understanding what's going on because my parents are musicians. Um, so I need to play something more lyrical and pretty. And so it's going to change a little bit of how I'm going to approach these works. Uh, my dad's going to want me to play something super loud. He loves when horns play loud. So I'm going to have to alter that a little bit. So just think about who your target audience is when you're playing this as well, because you want them to be entertained. You want them to be intrigued and, and like engaged in while you're playing. Uh, going back to composer collabs, it's a great idea. Are you gonna are you gonna use someone like this? Are you going to acknowledge them in your recital? How, what part are they going to play? Um, chamber music. A lot of our a lot of successful students had to give a chamber recital or incorporate chamber music throughout our recitals. Um, and another thing you need to think about with that is do you need a conductor? A lot of people have never really end up using one, but I've seen people do like horn choir pieces on a recital and they use a conductor. It's totally cool. It's, it's an option. It's something different that you don't see every day. And again, how much control do you have over these decisions? Um, our, our goal with this is you want as much variety as you can to keep your audience engaged, but you don't want to throw so much of them that they're distracted by the changes. You don't, you don't want to really stretch the, the limits too far, always. Now, this is just horn players, because then we like to have fun doing what we want. But how often are you just performing for horn players? 
All right. So next we're going on to when. Um, this matters a lot more than you might think. So when are you performing? What, what time of day? What day of the week? Um, is it accessible for the audience you're trying to attract? If you are trying to get your family, if you're a student and you're trying to get your family to come in and they have to drive from out of town, like you probably want something not too early or not too late, uh, probably on a weekend, easier for them. Uh, think about what else is going at, on at your school and in your town at the time. Uh, <laughs> When I was at UMKC, there was a day every semester, it felt like where there would be like three or four or maybe even five horn recitals on the same day. And that's a lot. So try and avoid that if you can. It's kind of fun in some ways, but it's just a lot. So think about what else is going on. Uh, and I included advertising in this because that can have some decision make, that can cause you to make some certain decisions about when um, so advertising on social media, you can use Canva. Canva produced these beautiful slide theme, this slide theme I'm using today. Um, and then again, how much control do, do you have over these decisions? When I was thinking about this, one thing that stuck out to me was when I was in my master's degree at Indiana, there's so many people giving recitals all the time and recital times just get picked super quick. And I ended up giving my second master's recital at 11 p.m. on Easter Eve because it was the most convenient time for me that I could get. It was ridiculous. I would never want to do that. So try and avoid things like that. And your goal with the win is you want to have the largest audience possible, right? Whatever your target audience is, you want them to be able to get there and be there for your, for your performance. So win matters a lot more than a lot of people think. And then we move on to the where. Uh, venue matters a lot as well. Um, as, you're, as you're looking at venues, think about what you can do with it, what you can do within the space. Is it set up for a recital already or is that something that you're going to have to change? Um, this also kind of goes in with how you can interact with it. If you're playing in a performance hall and it has a balcony, would you wanna play something from the balcony? Uh, if you want to play something that starts off stage, or you can make it an off stage piece, can you do that? How can you play around with the space and use it to be more effective and just make the change? Can you incorporate multimedia aspects? Um, for me, this was thinking about when I did a DMA lecture recital, I had to have a room that either had a project projector or I could put a projector in. You can use a projector in a lot of other ways as well. If you just want like a different background for every piece that you're playing, it just adds something else. It's such a cool idea. Um, and then multimedia can also be like sound, like are you gonna play anything with electronics? Anything like that, like can your space adapt to whatever you need? That can also affect your decision-making. Uh, lighting, can you change it? Do you wanna change it? Once you get out of a performance hall, lighting can be an issue. So make sure whatever space you're using has good enough lighting. Make sure you'll be able to see your music, your accompanist can see the music, or you have stand lights, things like that. And if it's not necessarily what you want, can you change it? Can you bring on in your own lights? Some spaces don't let you really alter what the space is. So make sure you ask those questions. And then, is it accessible? Is there parking? Living in a city, most places have parking here in Kansas City, but I know bigger cities that can be an issue. Um, and is there plenty of parking? Is there free parking if it's on campus it, and it's like a Thursday night? Can your mom and dad park on campus or do they need to figure something else out? Uh, make sure there's plenty of seating and that this seating is comfortable for all types of people because you never know who's coming. And then get out of the concert halls. It's so tempting, especially when you're at a university and you have a recital hall there and you might not have to pay for it or it might be included in a fee somehow. Try going somewhere else. A lot of us here at UMKC perform in churches. There were a couple of churches really close to campus that worked for us. Um, and a lot of those churches don't charge anything. Um, some of them do and you can choose whatever you want with that. Um, there's also a lot of like art galleries around that will let you do performances. A lot of like meeting spaces, a couple of the libraries around have like performance spaces in their libraries. It's just cool. There's different ideas. Outdoors, something that is a really cool thing that Kansas City does is they have a series where they 
have performances on our streetcar that runs through town. Mix it up, do something fun, get out of the concert hall. It's just, it, it livens it up a little bit, it, like takes the stiffness out of being in a concert hall. It just makes it a little more fun. And again, <clears throat> how much control do you have over these decisions? You might be a student at a university where you have to perform in the recital hall. That's your only option. That's your only choice. If that's your case, it's fine. See what you can do with it. Have some fun. And your goal here is just to use your space in as many ways as you can, as long as the audience is comfortable. You don't want to overwhelm them, but you want to keep them engaged. And then <clears throat> let's go to the why. For this, this was something that I struggled with as a student because I normally had teachers that were a little pushy with the music that I played and I just kind of eventually gave in or I tried to like find something close instead of finding something I really wanted to play. So you, this is this is so important. You have to have some sort of personal connection with the works you're performing. So why are you playing this music? Is it literally just because the teacher told you to? Is it because it's you're doing it for an upcoming competition and it's just like, it, it, you have to figure out whether there's some personal meaning or not. And you can always find some personal meaning, but your audience is gonna know how connected to the music you're playing that you are or you're not. Um, what does the music mean to you? And then what place does it hold in our rep? Coming back to this again, um, this, can, this can affect the why a lot as well. Um, for me personally, when I was reflecting on this, I didn't start horn until very late. I didn't start horn until the end of high school. And even when I started college, I wasn't, I didn't know I was gonna be a horn player yet. I had never played Mozart. I had never played Strauss before college. Like none of this existed in my brain. So a lot of the stuff I played in undergrad were all of those pieces that everyone plays in high school and comes to college already knowing. So that kind of affected why I played certain rep in undergrad. Maybe that's you, maybe, you would already played that rep and you're being asked to play it again in undergrad. How can you kind of twist your teacher's arm to get you out of that? Uh, what, what's missing? What's missing from your recital? And the next line I have there is have people look at your program and ask for advice. Have non-hornists look at your program and ask questions. It's kind of identify some gaps if you have a theme, so gaps within your theme um, or just overall gaps like Maybe, maybe in the order of your programming, something like that. Just have people look at your program before you settle on it. Just to see what people think and talk through it a little bit with someone. Doesn't make sense. It might not, and you might not realize that if you don't talk to someone about it first. It might just be something that you and your teacher decided, okay, this rep is great. We'll do it in this order, fine. There's more to it than that. So make sure that everything makes sense. And again, how much control do you have over these decisions? We kind of talked about that earlier, um, but that can really affect why you end up playing music. And if it's just because someone told you to do it, you have to stop and think, do I really want to play this? Because if you don't have any sort of connection making you want to play this music, the audience ultimately is going to find out and they're going to know. All right, <clears throat> so now comes the fun part, the how. So how are you going to turn all of your thoughts to all of these questions that we're talking about today and more questions that you're coming up with while you're listening to this? How do we turn these thoughts into actions? Um, and some things that I think about is who are you listening to? And this comes from what music you're listening to, but also who your teachers are, who your mentors are. What sort of viewpoints are you getting centered towards you to help you choose rep? Are they toxic or are they open-minded? Are they actually helping you? Or do you have a lot of personal opinions or are you just kind of going with the flow and being like, yeah, I'll play whatever. None of those things are bad, but you have to start to think about why you're getting to your endpoint and how you're going to get there and whether it's good for you or not. Um, <clears throat> another thing is educate your audience. So that's an easy way to turn this into an action as well. Use your voice. A lot of people love speaking at their recitals. I will first and foremost admit, I hate speaking at my recitals. I don't like doing it. I don't want to do it. Please don't make me do it. I hate it. I am stressed out enough about playing the horn. Please don't make me talk. Uh, but some people are not like that. Some people, it calms them down. If you're one of those people, great, amazing. Use your voice. If not, put it in a program notes. You can talk about your theme there, your connections, 
you can give a little bit of background on your music. That's the point of program notes. Um, so use this as an opportunity to educate your audience. Um, creating connections and themes, that's another great way. I'll show you in my resources how you can like find some groupings of works as well. And then how can you teach this? So this was something that was important to me when I was analyzing this, is how can I get my students involved in this process? And for me, something I've always done, and now I like stress it a little more than I used to, is I want my teachers, I want my students to listen every week. I want them, and they can take one practice session a week and turn it into a listening session if they want. I just encourage them to listen. And every week, every lesson, I want them to bring in a piece that they listen to that week. Bonus points of something I don't know. Usually as I have them. Um, bring in a piece with horn and just talk about it for two minutes. Tell me who wrote it, whether they like it or not. Kind of give me a place in time. Give me some dates, composer dates, dates it was composed. Give me just a little bit of history, a little bit of background and why you like it or why you don't like it. Some students will come in and be like, I found this piece while I was trying to find something and I hate it and I just want to talk about it. Great, let's talk about it. Why don't you like it? Uh, that's, that's just how it applies for me for teaching. So my action item for you is to look at your past recitals, analyze them and ask yourself what, who, when, where, why, and how. Just kind of take those as starting points and really think about you know, like what influenced my past programming and how can I build upon that for the future? Your goal is to use all the resources that are available to you. So now let's get into resources. All right, so <clears throat> uh, warning, this is a lot. It ends up being like over six pages of resources when it's all spelled out. It's all available on my website. I will actually, we can pop over there now. If you go to my website, click on goodies and then scroll down to DEIA resources. It's all right there. Um, and there's a link beside everything, it's super easy to use. If you have anything to add, please email me. This is not a comprehensive list, it's still growing. If you have something you wanna share, please check it out. Please add things. <clears throat> all right. Um, so next thing in resources is social media. It's a great place to find some resources, um, especially right now, uh, Instagram is kind of, the place to be for resources because images are a great place to kind of like attract people. And um, the first example for social media I'm going to use is Protestra. They have a lot of really cool information here. They've started doing playlists, like everyone that they highlighted in Women's History Month, and now have a Spotify playlist for. They have um, their link tree, tons of great resources. There's just a lot happening here. It's a great space to use. Oh, thank you for posting that in there, Josiah. Uh, Facebook groups. We have Horn Facebook groups. If, if you are on Facebook, use them. Um, one recent thing I did with Horn people, I, I asked, hey, y'all, I'm looking for some unaccompanied pieces by LGBTQIA plus composers, preferably works that are easy to purchase. Thanks. I got a ton of attraction on this post by people being like following, 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 but no one really had anything to add. And I was like, uh, this is kind of weird. Um, I figured I would get some hits on that. Um, I finally did have someone that sent me a private message and was like, hey, Peter Maxwell Davies was gay. I had no idea. I've played some of his music. He has two on that company pieces for Horn. <clears throat> it's just a great, it's a great resource if you're looking for things. It's, there's thousands of people in that group. It's a great starting point. And you can just ask general questions like that. Everyone's there to help you. Scores. Um, so thinking about how to get them if you don't always want to buy them, check with your library first. If you're a student or a teacher, your library, if it's something that's not in the collection, they can often interlibrary loan, ILL is what that means. Um, they can interlibrary loan it and get it from somewhere else. If there's a library on the face of the planet that owns it, your library will probably work with you to get that music for you. Um, public libraries also are normally members of some sort of interlibrary loan consortium. I know our, our public libraries here are a member of what's called Mobius. So it's kind of like a Midwest library consortium. So if I wasn't a student or I wasn't working for a university, I could go to the public library and be like, hey, I'm looking for this piece. Can I order it through you? 
And most of the times they can figure out a way to make that happen as well. There are so many places for scores now and all of these aren't necessarily for horn. Now, a lot of my resources are for other performing arts, um, but I wanna highlight a couple. No Broken Links um, goes through the instruments of a woodwind quintet. And the horn directory is here. It's most, I'm the editor for this. I just took this over. Um, most of the most of the resources right now are for chamber music, mostly woodwind quintet, but there are like 250 resources on here. It's a great place to start if you're looking for music. We're also gonna add solo rep and things like that in there. Um, and then there's also a book, The Guide to Solo Horn Rep. If you've never seen this book, it's available through Indiana Press. A lot of libraries have it. If your library doesn't have it, see if they can get it, or even if they can get the ebook version, at least they can check it out. It's, there's so much repertoire in here and it's all annotated. So you get a little a bit of information. He talks about range. It's the amount, this, this resource is just, I would recommend everyone to buy it if you can, but I realize not everyone can. Just get your hands on this. It's amazing for writing papers and anything you need to do. Uh, and then there's books. And like I said, these kind of branch across all performing arts, but a great place to start is the Oxford Handbook for Social Justice and Music Education. It's, I think like five years old now. Um, so you can get a used copy for a pretty cheap. It's a great place to start. It kind of gets you thinking about everything. The chapters are divided through different aspects of social justice and how that applies to music. Amazing place to start. Um, and then there's also In Her Own Words. It's another one I'll recommend. It, it, it's conversations with composers. Jennifer Hinton's in there, Chen Yi's in there. A lot of really great information just about how they feel in this world as female composers. And there's a ton of other things here, like I said, all on my website. Articles, I'll highlight a couple of these. Confronting Racism and Sexism in Music Theory. This is a multi-part article. If you scroll down, you'll see um, the six parts here. Beethoven was an average composer, was an above average composer. Let's leave it at that. Great little article if you were interested in all in checking that out. It, it will really change your mind about what you learned in music theory and what we're missing out on. And then 10 ways to check your musical bias. There's a little checklist here. Um, again, this is kind of music education focused, um, but you can apply it to most of what we do. It's just a nice short little read. You can just kind of identify some areas there. And then other, there's a lot of reading lists, a lot of webinars that are still continuing to happen. Um, some of them have like a monthly series or different workshops that they've done together for weekends, stuff like that. Uh, podcasts, I'm gonna highlight a couple podcasts here. The podcast called Here Together, it's from the Philadelphia Orchestra and they release monthly, I believe. Um, and it's just social justice interviews. They're talking about social justice and classical music. It's really great. You can listen to all of their um, episodes from the webpage here. Really love that one. Now the other one is the Classically Black podcast. They talk about what it's like to be a classical music professional as a black person. It's really interesting. They have 128 episodes. It's something I check out every week. It's it's a lot of fun and you really learn a lot and they they really make you think outside of the box and question what your education has been in the past and how we're gonna change your movement forward. Um, okay, so that's all I have for the resources. Like I said, they are all on my website. So please go check those out. If you have any others that you think should be added to my list, please email me, let me know. Um, these slides and everything are going to be available on the website as well, so you can refer back. Um, so just for a little discussion, pop into the chat here if you want. Make sure you're chatting with all panelists and attendees. And just kind of give a little feedback on why are we talking about this now? It doesn't matter. Is this important? Is this important? What are your thoughts? I'll give it just a couple minutes. Just kind of throw a couple ideas in there. Just kind of like what you're thinking about.
or not. I'm not really seeing anything come through. <laughs> That's okay. Um, and then I also want to know what's your favorite horn piece that no one knows or you think no one knows. That's why I put it in quotations there. Um, I'll add mine here. The Yenner Trio, it's pretty cool. Not a lot of people know it. Um, I played it on my first DMA or so here. Really cool. It's very long and it's pretty taxing. It's a lot of fun. I don't know if people, oh, there we go. Oh yeah. I don't know that I know that that one. Now you can answer the first question too if you're still thinking about it and you have anything else to say. Um, but I will go ahead and move on to my last slide here. We'll go ahead and just open this up to a general Q and A. Oh, I see a couple. Oh, the Ethel Smith Concerto for Horn and Piano. I just recently found that for the first time. It's beautiful. It's, oh, I can't believe I never heard it. Thank you for saying that, Laura. I, I forget that it, I even recently found it. And then Jeffrey said, not a question, but a comment. Thanks for this very timely. Um, uh, Elizabeth, is it Raum, Raum, uh, Pantheon for Horn Trio? She's, she's also written an unaccompanied piece that I can't remember the name of right now, but it's really it's a really cool multi-movement piece. Romp, that's a great piece. Um, I would like to play, learn music from countries outside of Europe, but there doesn't seem to be any. What are some great, good researchers for that? Um, the Horn Rep book that uh, Rick and Linda wrote, great resource. They kind of have it, um, I believe in the back you can search country or composer, I think, I can't remember. Um, but some of those other websites that are on my list, you can also search for um, country of origin. And there are a lot of schools now are putting out diversifier repertoire lists as well. There's a couple on my resource list um, that offer some other resources, especially for finding scores. Um, but there's a new one there's nothing for horn on it yet, so I haven't added it to my list, but it's Native American composers. Something else to think about because normally, like you said, we normally just end up playing or end up playing European composers. Um, oh yeah, I don't know a lot of these pieces that y'all are putting in there. See, there's so much music. We're never gonna run out of music. Stop playing the same stuff everybody else plays. That's kind of my feeling about all this. Um, so if you have any other questions, go ahead and pop them into the chat. This is all I have. Um, I just wanted to have a nice discussion here at the end. So you can stick around if you want and we can chat a little bit more. Um, like I said, the reading list, the resources and these slides will all be on my website. Um, I'll put this recording there too if, that, if they're sending out the recording. Um, so that's all there for you to use as much as you want. Reach out to me, send me an email. There's my website again, um, or find me on Instagram at tracy.j.bass. I love connecting with horn players. Instagram is pretty much the only thing I really use. I have Facebook, I don't really use it. Um, but it's just a fun way to connect. I like the visual aspect of this. Oh, we have some more. Ooh, horn soprano and digital media. That sounds cool. Horn violin piano. It's such a great, that's such a great combo. Cool. Yeah. If you have any other questions, go ahead and pop those in. Oh, I answered these live. Answer live. Answer live. Dun, dun, dun. If you have anything else to add in the chat, please feel free. But otherwise, that's all I had for today. I'll give it a couple more seconds to see if anyone puts anything else in the chat. Oh, <laughs> thank you all for coming. This is fun. This is something I've been wanting to do for a while. Oh, yes, it's important. No time like the present to talk about these things. But I think we are especially beginning to see a rise in awareness. Yeah, equity university. Yeah, for sure. 
like I said, this kind of applies to everything, all aspects of life. This isn't just about the horn. This isn't just about horn and music. Let's keep moving past those and apply to everything in life. Absolutely. Oh, another key in here. What about commissioning new works? Yeah, for sure. Um, I talked about that a little bit with collaborating with composers. If you are in a place where there are other student composers or you work professionally with composers, talk to them, let them know what you want for the horn. Something I, I personally want is more on a company works. We have a ton um, and we definitely have our standards for on a company works, but I really want on a company works that are more accessible for more people. To me, I feel like most of the things that are being written right now are written with a specific performer in mind. And so when I pick up a piece, there's things that like, this is gonna sound bad. I don't really wanna do in the piece. I should do them. I should learn these works. But I look at them and I'm just like, ah, and I get intimidated. And so I get kind of turned off. I would like to see more unaccompanied works that are for everybody. Um, oh, Jessica raised hand. You can type in the chat if you want. Um, that's great, appreciate it. Male identifying. Yeah, I thought about putting a positionality statement in here as well. I don't know if you all know what positionality statements are. Uh, basically, you describe how you identify. So I'm a gay white male. And so this is my perspective on all of this. I am by no means a comprehensive perspective on all of this. I only have my education and my past to kind of reflect on. Uh, thank you for sharing all these resources. No problem. Please let me know if you know of more. What about arranging works by BIPOC composers? Any tips on how to approach? Yeah, so that's something I'm very fortunate here at UMKC that most of our composition students are from Asia because we have Chen Yi and Zhou Long here. Um, so we get a lot of, a lot of our works that are being written through the university are by Americans. Um, it, can be, it can be kind of hard to find composers, especially in America, that aren't white, depending on where you are and who the teachers are. So I would recommend reaching out to foreign universities. It's something you can totally do, um, especially if you find a composer that you like and they don't teach in America, they're not American, reach out to them and see if they teach at a university. And if they do, what are their students writing? It's just a jumping off point way to kind of start a conversation. Um, but yeah, it's tricky. It's tricky. You kind of, you have to put in the work. You have to find those people and it can kind of be hard, especially when you're living in America. Um, but there's definitely universities with certain composers that you can wrench out a little bit. Um, I'm here listening, love all this, just busy working on IHS. You're awesome, yay! Uh, more so when works with, uh, yeah. Yeah, something, I feel like that gets left out a lot is what does the audience, what's your target audience and what do they wanna hear? This is all great. Just take a couple more minutes to see if anybody else has anything to add to the chat and then we can turn it over to the next person. I'm really tired today. I just got my vaccine and I'm very thirsty and just exhausted. <laughs> Love all universities involved in IHS. They should be spawned. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. If if you're a university teacher or if you teach any students in any capacity, tell them about the international workshop. It's gonna be great. There's, there's going to be so many different types of presentations and performances there. Even if it's online, it's more accessible for everybody. See, accessibility. Asking composers what other composers they know. Yeah. Yeah, so this is another thing. A lot of composers are afraid to write for the horn. That's something I realized in my master's. Um, the way it works in Indiana, I think, 
as an undergrad, spend like a week on each instrument kind of. Um, and that's something I got to do every semester was go into that class and every student I had to write like 30 measures for horn. And I went in and like sight read it and then told them what worked and what didn't work. Um, a lot of people don't have an opportunity like that. So if you are working with a composer, be like, let me look at it. Let me tell you, let me give you ideas. Let me show you what does and doesn't work. And there's a lot of resources out there for extended techniques for horn that show composers how to write them with sound examples and like what, what the possibilities are within an extended technique because there are limitations to most of them. Uh, horn player and guitarist, more electronic effect horn. I think that's becoming more and more popular, especially as people are kind of at home. I see more and more people posting videos where they're using pedals and all kinds of cool effects like that. I agree, I think it's, it's a lot of fun. Interesting in the right hand, yeah. <laughs> cool. All right, well, I'm gonna hop off of here so that the next person can get set up to start. Um, like I said, email me, uh, tbass.horn at gmail.com. Check out my website, tracyjbass.com. Um, let me know what you think, give me some more ideas. Uh, I'll be presenting at IHS, but I'm doing a lecture on uh, mind mapping your practice. It's something I, I did at the Southeast Horn Workshop recently. So if you're at IHS, come see me there again. All right, bye everybody. Have a good day. Thank you so much.